Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Daniel. How are you? I'm doing well. It's great to see you again. And so I thought, I have to, I have to take a look what you're doing here. Well, you're outstanding, Tom. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming today. I enjoyed our conversation so much the other day at the Parallax and everything like that. That was super sure. cool. So uh, so last week, if Chitan shows up, last week we were having a fun kind of conversations on the difference between um, Hegel and Deleuze and what can Deleuze think that Hegel can't think because there's clearly differences and what are the consequences of that and this kind of discussion on is there a need to go back and read Hegel if in fact you can find everything that's in Hegel Hegel and Deleuze, and then some, right? You have that question, ah, oh, there's Chitan, he is it, this guy's amazing. Uh, so I might, I might throw some questions at him, that's the context, because there was something we discussed last night at what's at stake in that debate, and I'm curious what Chitan has, says, because I went down a giant rabbit hole trying to read Berkson, uh, Deleuze on Berkson, The Logic of Sense, all these texts, because I'm a crazy person, and that's what I guess ends up. Chitan, how are you doing, Chitan? I'm good, I'm good. How are you all? I'm doing well. Now, Chitan, we had such a blast on Deleuze and Hegel. And Chitan, this is Tom from Parallax. Tom is outstanding. Uh, he stopped by today. We had a lot of fun the other day. So, Chitan, I'm going to throw a question at you because I went down that. So, I was really, really taken by your question last week on what's at stake in the conversation between Hegel and Deleuze. And so, yes, I am going to force you to talk about that again. Uh, your, if your computer malfunctions suddenly, I completely understand. Uh, <laughs> but the thing that I've really, really been thinking about that is sort of the question. This is what I would ask you. Okay, is radical repetition in, in Deleuze, which I allude to also repetition for itself, that I think is chapter three. Author, good to see you, author. How are you doing, sir? It's good to see you. We're talking about like Hegel and Deleuze right now for a minute. Author is a really good friend of mine. I adore this guy. It's good to have you here. And uh, and then we have Tom from Parallax, High Root, Zach, and Chitan. These are all great people, authors. So great to see you, sir. So Chitan, my question is this. All right, so if we're thinking about repetition for itself, this is what I want to ask. And you totally disagree if I'm wrong with this. So I read like his book on Berkson. I read Logic of Senses to cinema books and different things like that. Would you say that radical repetition in Deleuze can be associated with like transcendental emergence, like Bart will say, or emergence where you have like physics, physics, repeating it, physics, physics, and then suddenly it's chemistry. Chemistry is repeating as chemistry, repeating as chemistry, and then suddenly it's biology. Do you think it is fair? And please disagree, because if I'm wrong about this, I, I'd like, can we associate radical repetition in Deleuze with that kind of emergence? And thus he's kind of saying that Hegel can't think emergence, and therefore the dialectic is a false movement, because to have a real movement that's a real sublimation, it has to be like totally different, not just sort of a different of something that's pre-existing. What do you think of that? Please disagree if you totally disagree. No, no, I don't. <laughs> I think you you know a lot more. But yeah, you're right in some sense that Deleuze would argue from his position at least that that Hegel can't think radical repetition. Mm. For Hegel, repetition always gets broken before it gets completed in that sense. Mm. But for Deleuze, uh, radical repetition leads to radical newness. Mm. It's only when something repeats radically that a radical break occurs from the past. Mm. You no, know, if something new emerges with that before the repetition is complete, what you get is simply repetition of another cycle. Mm. Radical growth happens when the cycle is complete, and there's nothing more to be done over there. And then the you no, know, so uh, that kind of <coughs> thing, uh, you know, Delius is trying to sort of you know argue. Uh, is it fair to say that Delius is saying it is only because of that Hegel is a false movement? Uh, I don't think so. I think that is one of the reasons, definitely. But I think uh, there is problem with Hegel is deeper than uh, simply, you know, Hegel, Hegel not able to think some uh, conceptual uh, in, in that sense, you know? Sure, 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 sure. I, I think also there's a kind of way, um, I you know, in Hegel, there's a kind of dialectic that is you try to represent a concept, you try to make that representation actually fully capture the concept. Then you fact figure out it can't do that, so it fails, and then you have to change the representation and on and on and on and on. And there's a sense in which that, you know, Deleuze may say, well, that's kind of a false movement because that's all in your head, right? You know, that's just kind of a concept that's falling back into different forms of representation, right? Um, but if we stick, so this would be the next question. If we, if we at least grant the kind of idea that there's something where Deleuze is saying that Hegel can't think emergence, which I actually think is kind of fair, um, this is what I would ask. Is it fair to say that Hegel won't think emergence because that's to validate the Owl of Nineveh, where the philosopher is not supposed to think the future and therefore not try to guess 
what may emerge in the future. And therefore they're putting that restriction on themselves. And maybe, we, would it, do you think, and maybe I'm now engaging in a creative interpretation because I wrote a really long paper because I'm trying to figure out how to make Deleuze and Hegel go together, right? And then, then I think this actually has practical consequences and those would be what be at stake, but that will be the next thing I say. Um, do you think it's almost fair, or maybe I'm being too creative in my interpretation to say there's something about Hegel that won't think emergence because that would require to think the future and he's kind of set it up in the philosophy of right where the philosopher doesn't think that. Might that be an angle we go at? Yeah. So there's, there's a very nice talk by Zizek on this issue. It's, it's an issue. He's talking on, I think the talk's titled On Negativity. I can sort of put the link. Uh, where Basically, he agrees, Zizek agrees with Delius. Uh, to mm-hmm. that extent that that uh, that Hegel can't think radical repetition, but Zizek's argument there is that do not take something very lightly where Hegel can't think something, because mm-hmm. where Hegel can't think something, it's precisely a very Hegelian thing that is missing. Right, right. What right, he's missing right. is a very Hegelian moment when he's not able to think something, and mm-hmm. he, has a, he has a very nice argument why what Hegel is missing mm-hmm. actually is its most radical Hegelian. You know? Right, right, right. Um, right. So what Delis actually misses in Hegel, say let's take it from Zizek's point of view, would exactly be that he's not able to see that Hegel needs to repeat itself. Mm. For Delis, they, they, they needs to be a radical break from Hegel. Mm. For Zizek, there has to be a radical repetition of Hegel. And right. it is that distinction that we need to be thinking about. Sure, sure. So that Delis wants that break from Hegel, from the whole Kant to Hegel, German idealist tradition itself. Mm, Hegel is mm. that break. And, Ka- and Zizek wants to repeat that radically. Mm. In both cases, there might be a break. Mm. But they're both very different kinds of movements. Mm. Uh, mm. You know, uh, to achieve yeah. that. Well, that, well, that's an interesting, Frank, that's an interesting way to put that, Chitan. And uh, I think what's happening, I'm trying to do Bluetooth instead of like the wired thing. So my computer's like, that's way too advanced. You can't have two speakers at once. And it's not happy about that. So, you know, we'll see. I might have to turn these off. Uh, these wonderful TJ Maxx Bluetooth uh, microphones. Wow. I tell you. Um, but anyway, that's Did really interesting. Did you get some money for that or not? You know, I take checks. For that Anyone class? here that I can give an, a, a, an address. So, you know, anytime. Uh, but uh, I'll have to ask my uh, seven-year-old if his lemonade stand is doing well, and I'll put some equity in it, and we'll see what happens. So that might go well. But uh, but no, I, I guess. Um, well, Chita, that's a really great way to put it. So the next, so the next question would be, and this would almost be kind of the kind of practical difference almost. Like in Hegel, we get Javier, good to see you, sir. Uh, in, in Hegel, there's almost like a real emphasis on dialectically working through negativity, right? Um, and if we dialectically work through negativity and face our negativity and different things like that, then basically if we take the philosophy of right, he's like, and then the future will come from that. And in fact, working through our negativity dialectically is what's best for the future, because if we think about planning the future, we're not really working through our dialectical negativity or dealing with our own demons and stuff like that. And that's actually precisely why the future ends up worse, right? And so there's a sense in which it's like, yeah, you know, if you could say with Hegel, it's like, yeah, emergence can occur, but I don't think about that because I'm gonna like, because if I think about that, I can start thinking about what it should be like and what I would like it to be like and how to sort of design it in a way that can distract me from the work of dialectically working through my negativity. And actually the best way to create the conditions for uh, that emergence is for everyone to dialectically work through their negativity, right? Which then gives rise to people that say, are psychologically mature, they don't have emotional baggage that they're throwing on one another, and that therefore creates the condition where you get a better future or you get a different emergence. Now, Deleuze may come along and he'd be like, yeah, but if you don't ever think about like radical repetition or you don't, and I actually think I've been very curious about intuition in Deleuze, where he talks about continually with that in terms of Bergson. And he's like, and if you don't really intuit though the future, then how do you know what you're making? How do you know what's coming about? What if you give rise to like a Lovecraft creature out of emergence, right? You know, come on, Hegel, we got to do some thinking of the future, right? Do you really just want to like focus now on dialectical negativity and not think about the future? Um, And then it's almost like Hegel's like, if I imagine those two talking, and maybe right now they are talking in some alternative dimension, um, all over coffee, brandy, hard to say. Uh, and, and like Hegel's like, but no, 
it, it's too tempting. And also, I don't like intuition. I told you that at the beginning of the phenomenology of spirit to lose. That, that's that stuff where you, uh, without conceptual mediation, have an image of how stuff's supposed to be. And that's really, really dangerous. And to lose is like, but come on, man, you got to have some intuition to be, even begin dialectical mediation, right? You have to have some image of the future in different things. And then they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm curious if that's starting to get at, because I'm really interested in this question of what's at stake that you posed last time, Chitan. Is that, would you think that's kind of circling some of what's at stake? And then I have to reread all of the Deleuze and Hegel five more times to maybe approach it. I, I, I have my own interpretation on it, but... Uh... But to come to your point, see, if you look at Hegel seriously, I don't think Hegel is is that anti-intuition as we make it out to be, to be honest mm. with you. You know, uh, that's, that Deleuze's problem with immediacy is not simply that immediacy is bad and so on and so forth. Deleuze understands that without immediacy, there's no movement possible. Hegel's problem is that when we get stuck in immediacy, when mm. we think of immediate as itself the end of its, its own uh, process, Mm. That is where Hegel sort of, you know, has an, has an issue with that, with that kind. And I think that that is where Hegel and Deleuze might agree with, you know, if they were sitting across each other in that sense, that they both will agree that even when in Deleuze, movement is ex extremely important. It may not right. be a dialectical movement, but movement is essential for De Deleuze also. Mm. And if movement is important, then you will not be able to come to terms with immediacy as, as, it, as, as it is, you know. Your mm. argument cannot be that immediacy itself can find uh, find us some kind of a you know a radical. Um, so given that that constraint, uh, what is at stake then becomes uh, you know uh, I think what is at stake becomes this this question that that Hegel is against abstraction and for Deleuze Hegel himself is abstraction. <laughs> you know <laughs> that is kind of the structure you get into. And that structure, I think, uh, Deleuze's response to Hegel, as I said, it's not only a response to Hegel. It, mm. is, it is a response to certain Western um, historical trajectory mm. you know, that, that, that Deleuze has. And Deleuze is seeking to escape that without actually going to the end of it in some senses. Mm. You know, and what, what, is, what is at stake in, in, in thinking through this Western metaphysics, uh, you know, as, as it emerges? I think something as big as that is, that is at least that is my interpretation. That mm. is what is at stake in in a discussion like this. It's not simply, you know, that that do we need to go back and affirm that past or not? Mm. Mm. What is our relationship with that with that history, with all mm. its problems? And let's be honest, uh, you know, if if modern science has to uh, today has something to say, it has something to say because it came from modern, you know, uh, uh, Greek philosophy. Because it has its roots in Greek philosophy. Mm, mm. So, so if, if you have to be honest about it, you have to start thinking in that in that manner that that what what needs to be a relationship to this history now. No, it, I think that's a really interesting way to put it because indeed there's a kind of why why do you put it last time? Why do we need the initiation of Hegel, right? Why do we have to go through that initiation? Is there something one gains in Hegel that without there is some deficit that is really, really quite problematic. Um, I think that's very interesting. My by, you know, I, I the more I think of like this kind of dialectically working through negativity, I would think on. I do also want to note that I think the intuition that Hegel critiques at the beginning of the phenomenology of spirit is not the same that intuition that like Bergson is talking about. They're not the different in character. Now, this will get us into joy of those different distinctions. Um, but the thing you said on movement, it makes me think of Javier's recent piece where he's talking about knowledge without reason and how like once you give reasons for why you love, that almost like cheapens love because it reduces it to that and almost hurts the movement of the love or the dance of the love uh, and how there's always a problem in providing representation or reasons for something that is done precisely because that can kind of kill the movement. So Javier, I liked your, your video. Thank you for watching the video, Daniel. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly kind of go through my thoughts on that. Um, it actually kind of got inspired from reading Milan Kundera, <laughs> where he, he sort of, in the narrative of slowness, he, um, the character sort of has a distaste for someone giving reasons for why they love him. Um, and I started thinking more about this, that implicit within giving a reason, there's the shadow of that reason, meaning like the moment you give a reason for living, you also have simultaneously the reason for dying because once that reason is gone, that is the reason for dying, is it not? You know, so so finding that reason to live is, 
ironically also finding the reason to die. Um, and this is actually what kind of leads people into sort of existential crisis, right? Like they thought my purpose was to be a fireman and then all of a sudden an accident happens and I'm no longer able to walk, right? So I'm in a crisis now. My reason was being a fireman, but now I don't have a reason. So it seems that every time we give reasons, there is the shadow of that reason, which is sort of haunting us um, in its immediacy. Um, but I, I, I think that there's a way to sort of approach that, meaning like my favorite example is like um, when you're hungry, um, but you don't know what to eat, but you're just hungry. Like you know that you're hungry, but you don't know what to eat. It's that kind of frustrating tension where you like, I need an object so that way I can eat something, <laughs> but I'm hungry. So I, I think there's a way to approach reason in the sense that I'm giving reason because I have to give reason. That is the risk that I take with giving reason. But I also know that the risk is that it doesn't capture everything. It's never going to capture it. Um, so I think that's what's very important to understand is that when we give reasons, the same way if someone were to ask you, hey, why do you love reading philosophy so much? To give a reason to it, we kind of know like that's that doesn't really capture why I'm so pulled to philosophy, why I'm so why I love philosophy or mathematics, right? But it's this sort of acknowledgement from the other of like, I love that you love philosophy kind of thing. It's, it's that kind of just acknowledgement of like, I don't know why you love it, but I love that you love it, right? Um, and I think that's a sort of beautiful thing. And, and that's what I call living without reason. Um, even though ironically, you have to give a reason, you know that in the end, it cannot capture what is being presented. And I think that kind of shows the risk of representation, like representation has a sort of shadow of itself um, that we have to just sort of just be cognizant of. I, I think that's really it. Um, now, the things that you were raising um, when you said working through the negativity sort of becomes the condition, um, it actually made me think like my work on timing where isn't it possible that the other person can become the conditions for you working through your negativity? So in this case, then I guess my question would be, is negativity then kind of a communal uh, practice, sort of, so to speak, right? Like, how do I ever confront my negativity if, it, if it's not from via another, right? Um, so I think there seems to be a framing that the other can have that helps me have an epiphany. I think maybe, you know, would you call an epiphany sort of like a working through or the realization of my negativity or something like that? Um, I don't know, but yeah. Oh, that's marvelous. And, it, and then, you know, to fit into what we were saying, there's almost a question of, does Hegel enable you to live without reason uh, in a special way that Deleuze cannot? Or is it better just to go to Deleuze's way of doing things that helps you live without reason in the, in the realm of that excess that keeps it from being uh, um, reduced, reductionist or different things, just as well as Hegel? Right. And then the great uh, debate uh, continues in different things. And um, it is quite funny that like when somebody asks you, why do you do philosophy or why do you love painting or why do you like to run? And you're like and it feels automatically it feels wrong. Like it's so weird. Like it feels like uh, like and it's also it does make me think of kind of Socrates asking people like, so why do you think that's justice? And they're like, dang it. Uh, dang it. Uh, so it's like, uh, and it's very interesting right there that that goes to show you how human beings do primarily operate according to reason almost secondarily, or kind of like where reason, you could almost, I'm going to use that capital letter move, you almost have like reason with a capital R that you, can, that you can't put into terms, and then when someone asks, you have to give a lowercase r reason. Um, that seems tragically necessary uh, because you relate to other people, and that's why I, I am partial. I think that's kind of the structure of the phenomenology or a lot of Hegel, right? It's like you, this consciousness goes to self-conscious, you encounter it, there's this otherness that's constantly developing, that's forcing you to encounter a failure that then moves you to the next stage of the phenomenological journey, so on and so on, but it's like progress by frustration in a kind of way. Uh, and then that stages of the cross and all these different languages that he uses. Um, so there's a kind of tragedy where we all live by a kind of capital R reason that we're forced to then put into language for other people that can feel like a betrayal of that capital R language. And that's why I think a lot of frustration, and then that's the problem of language, communication, other things like that. 
um, and living by. And it does make me think, and then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak. Again, carrier pigeons, flares, et cetera. Um, it makes me think, you know, I was I was watching, I know Dr. Vivekia started that after Socrates series and different things. And I, I liked how in uh, episode one, he was saying by after Socrates, he means like chasing after Socrates, you know, like a prey, like an animal, like you're after Socrates. I thought that was quite a, a lovely play on words. So that's a great title. After Socrates, like we're living after Socrates and we're after Socrates. Pretty good. Good marketing there. And um, and it makes me think how we all kind of live after a capital R reason that we're on the journey that we're going for. And it's almost like if you use what he's saying, you're on the hunt. And then someone from the side is like, hey, why are you hunting that deer? And you're like, uh, and then the deer gets away. <laughs> and you're like, crap, the deer got away. Uh, but but you, but you're kind of like you have to wait. You have to give reasons to other people for why you're chasing the deer, if they're going to help you chase the deer, or they're going to like interact with you chasing the deer. But in doing that, there's always a distraction from the deer, or maybe you like lose focus of it and now it's gone. Because when somebody asks you, why do you like philosophy? You may give your reasons and then you're like, why do I do this? This is kind of stupid. And then you go off, right? So there's a, there's a risk in which when somebody asks you, you then lose that emotion. Exactly like with love. You made that example in your video. When you love someone and then someone's like, give your reasons. And you're like, uh, I can't. Well, if I can't give reasons, maybe I shouldn't love this person. And now the magic is gone. The enchantment is gone, right? Like you lose something in that. And it's very interesting that then we have to kind of figure out how to um, balance or deal with that tension to where we're able to give lowercase r reasons for our reason, capital R, without in that very act losing the capital R reason or things like that. And, and that, um, that, 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 that gets into what that looks like and how we think through and is the lose better at that? Is Hegel better at that or different things like that? Um, so with that, I'd, with anyone who would like to speak, please. So yeah, I think I think uh, I'm very sympathetic to I think I think Nietzsche made this critique of Socrates. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, like I mean, I can just imagine going to the marketplace and I'm on a mission to do something, and up comes Socrates and he goes, "Why are you going to the marketplace to get food? Why do you want to get food to eat? Why do you want to eat? Oh, fuck off, Socrates! Like, you know, <laughs> get out of my way! I got shit to do, you know." So for me, reason is is negative. Like if you ask somebody, if somebody asks me, why are you doing that? I'll say, why not? Right. And, and if they can't provide a good reason not to, then I'm going to keep doing it. Right. So and this is to me, this is actually representative of like the brain structure. Right. You can think of motivation like rising up from the bottom and then the cortex uh, uh, what do you call it? Represses that. Right. It's so it's like the fundamental motion of life is affirmative, right? The fundamental uh, reality is like, yes, let's do this. And then reason comes like, oh, maybe you shouldn't do that, right? And it constrains the the libido, right? Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't think you need a reason to do something. I think you need a reason not to do something. Um, now, there does come the question of like, how do you motivate? Like, if you've lost the will to live, right? Then what, right? And and I, I do think it's it's difficult to motivate somebody with reason. You know, I mean, if somebody's depressed and they've lost the will to live, not not reason to live, but they've lost the will to get up, like you can't reason them out of that. You know, I mean, you can't say, well, you know, you have all these reasons to live. It's like, I mean, maybe you can. I don't know. But but I, I guess there's will and reason in my mind and will kind of rises up from the bottom and reason constrains from the top down. So uh, that's just what I what I'm thinking of. No, I like that very much. I mean, definitely, I think in Nietzsche, like the, there's a you know, I'll do the capital letter move again. There's a capital W will that is fundamental. That then reason is simply what translates or comes off or challenges that will, right? And then for Nietzsche, there you well, a kind of Hegelian move would be to kind of negate the negative critiques of reason or rationality. Because the interesting thing about the word reason is always a mixture between rationality and motivation, right? Which can lead to kind of some different confusions or sort of what is the function of it. Like people say, my reason for living is my family. Okay, well, is that an intellectual proposition or is that an emotional proposition? Is it both propositions, you know, so on and so forth. But if you say my rationality is my family, uh, what? You know, that doesn't that doesn't make much sense. And yet we tend to use reason and rationality as kind of similes. But clearly there's a sort of difference between those. Right. Um, so like for Nietzsche, maybe we can say, although I've been using reason as kind of a simile for rationality, there's really a sense in which like for Nietzsche, 
rationality must be in service of will in order for it to become kind of a, a, dare I say, reason, you know, capital R reason. And that's kind of this mixture of those two. Or otherwise, like pure autonomous rationality leads to nihilism. Like it tears everything down. Like you can always find like a reason, a rationality for not doing something or not do something. So it tears down and tears down and it tears down. So I think bringing Nietzsche into that, and then as you know, I'm obsessed with thinking about Nietzsche as the unleashing of an intrinsic motivation, uh, uh, I think is, is a great framing for it. Um, and, and indeed, I think one of the great mistakes of philosophers is to think that rationality can of itself be a basis of motivation. Um, and that creates all sort of different problems. Um, so Javier, please. Uh, so yeah, actually, Zach kind of reminds me of the distinction I, I recently made between dying to live and living to die, where if you really think about it, right, the moment we're born, we're technically dying, <laughs> right? So what I have, my reframing is that instead of starting with living, we start with dying, right? That this, I am sort of working up towards living. Um, where it seems the framework living to die is this sort of like quantitative, objective sort of reasoning framework towards living, where it's like, I'm trying to do all that I can. I'm trying to accomplish all that I can so I can give meaning, I can give purpose um, so that I can die, right? So that I can die. Um, but see, when those things are gone, well, all you have left is to die. Um, you're left with the only option to die. So I think this reframing of, of living to die, I mean, dying to live, dying to live seems to kind of go with the passion of, of shooting towards living, um, that I'm already in a state of dying, but I am, I am living in a, in a deeper, more profound way um, because death is just sort of the gross event. It's, it's dying that we have a problem with. Um, but it's funny because death... You only realize dying when death becomes foreseeable. That's what's ironic about dying, is that the moment you have a clear picture about when you're going to die or thinking about going to die, that's when dying becomes very clear to you. But in fact, we're always dying. You know? But I, I reframe it in such a way that we don't begin with life, we begin with dying. And then we sort of work that way up there. It's interesting because like, you know, one could say that for Heidegger, like the, the, the trick is somehow thinking death before you're forced to think death by facticity, right? Like, and if you don't do that, you can't frame being because death is the, the mountain range of being or something right? Like that, right? Where he kind of frames it. And there is an interesting play where you say dying to live. And it's interesting how the word dying means longing. Very interesting. As if longing is to die. As, because it's almost like in order to get something, you have to sacrifice things. You could even say in order to get something, you have to let all your categories of what the thing is die because then you don't actually get it. You just get your idea of it or you don't get you don't get what the thing actually is. So there's an interesting way in which, you know, kind of death has a metaphor. Like you also have to die to your notions of how life is supposed to go, how things are supposed to go. You kind of have this openness to possibility or otherwise you're not dying to live, dying as a practice of which you're dying to all your expectations, dying to all your assumptions and different things like that, right? But then of course, like you're doing that precisely to encounter life more, which then of course, this is kind of the, you know, this is kind of the, the question. Can you do that and not immediately fall back into new categories you have to kill, you know, new propositions that you have to kill. And this is what, you know, this, this debate on kind of Hegel and, and different things like that. But there's this kind of like dying to live entails some sort of um, commitment to always undergoing that kind of self work of not um, allowing your notions to be stable. And then I would say like AA work in that way. Um, and then also, there's also a sense in that phrase, which you don't live if you're not willing to die for something. Like if you don't have something you're willing to die for or that you're dying for, that's thus forcing you in a Nietzschean sense to overcome, to encounter your weakness, to like to really struggle for, 
Because it feels like you're dying when you go to the gym, right? Like when you really work out, it definitely feels like you're dying. Or when you're really pouring your thoughts in to try to understand something, or you're really pouring yourself into something, it feels like you're dying. That's why people don't do it. Like if you didn't feel that way, everyone would do it, right? Why do we have to have all these practices and talks about doing that and the need to do that? Because there's something in the doing of it that's uncomfortable or feels like a threat or some like you might lose something or something bad can occur. So it's interesting to think and then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak that like dying to live um in, entails in it this kind of kind of a suggestion that there is no other way to live right that there's no other way uh to live or if you live it's more shallow it's missing something there's something not there uh, and, and then, of course, that would shatter a dichotomy where it's life or death, like an either or. There's somehow an integration that has to be carried out, which then you could talk about a negativity in Hegel uh, or, you know, or that or a constant uh, source of difference uh, in things like that. Uh, but I think that phrase is a fascinating phrase. You know, I think if, if we go back to this question of, I think, uh, the, Javier's raising with the question of reason and love in that sense, you know, that is where... We started, and I would like to sort of say something on that. I, I think Javier is right that it, 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 it is it is a question of, in some senses, what you call symbolic violence. That there is a certain violence that is always involved in naming something, you know, in 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 trying to restrict it to, to certain of its properties and excluding certain other properties from it, in some senses. So you know, if you ask why do you hate someone, it's good to have a reason for it. You know, <laughs> it, it's good because. Uh, at, that, at that at that point, it's good to be able to localize it to some very specific, you know. You know on the flip side, why love becomes a problem over there is it's an interesting uh, kind of a question because when when you try and locate love to certain only something specific, you know, uh, and exclude other things outside of it, love itself loses loses its balance. It itself loses its, it becomes instrumental in nature. You know, it, it immediately becomes something transactional. Because love in its, at, at its core represents the, and if you, you know, I, I think one of the ways of putting it is that, that human beings always struggle with having certain long-term end names. Human beings are always com more comfortable with looking at something which is immediate. You know, we can, we can get something immediate much more easily than, than, actually do an action which has a long term and this is where I think we, it will come back to that in, in some senses that human beings and love is, is, is the most radical affirmation of this, this relationship with you know a long term commitment with something in, in some senses which cannot be brought down to its immediate conceptual contours in some in, in, in a certain sense you know love represents that aspect of uh, being a human uh, no, and I, I think that is where I think the question of death comes back to it because uh, love would always have this radical cut with death because love always encapsulate, you know, um, um, uh, this question of limit within itself in, some, in, in that sense because it, it, it always crosses that limit. It always is an excess of that limit, whichever limit you try and draw from, from for it. You know, which is why you have, you have a phrase is like, you know, I think in every language, in Hindi, we always have that, you know, I can die for you in that sense, or I can I can die, you know, you know. In, in, when you're in love, it, it always sort of uh, mirrors back, you know. And, and I think in Hindi Bollywood movies, you see a lot of this happening where you know a girl would ask a guy, "Can you die for me?" You know, or a or a guy would. <laughs> you know, this is this is this is this is actually a part of a lot of uh, uh, cinematic trope in that sense, and I think it it exists because there is that 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 cut that exists both sides in some senses. So now I'm thinking, and I'll give it to Mr. Fishman. Um, I'm I'm now thinking about: Does that mean we should have a reason for the things we want to kill? Like it's good to have a reason for hate, precisely because you can kill it. When we tend to do the exact opposite, we have reasons for things we want to keep alive, and it's almost like you want to have reasons for the things you want to destroy, because then there's a uh, there's a way to finish it off, right? Like if you say, "Well, I hate this person because they're a jerk." Well, it's possible for them not to be a jerk. Oh, so that's good. Uh, and that's kind of funny because then it's like. Um, it's almost like you want to think of hatred in terms of reason. 
or or like a reason, and I'm blurring the terms between rationality and reason too, because English is a tyrant. Um, so, uh, you know, it's almost like you want to have a reason for hatred and a beauty for life. Like life is more of a beauty, something that attracts you and that you're after, but it's not reducible. So now I'm associating like hate, like reason with the things you want to deconstruct and, and beauty with the things you always want to have something more that you can't put into words and it therefore attracts you. So I'm thinking of that now, but, and maybe that's the, the uh, Paul Ricoeur hermeneutics of suspicion versus what Viveki calls the hermeneutics of beauty. So now that comes out in my head. So uh, anyway, Mr. Fishman, to put you on the spot, Mr. Fishman. I think that that hermeneutics of beauty versus hermeneutics of suspicion is, is uh, a good thing to bring up here, right? Because like, if you say, I will do this, um, you can either you can either take that as um, kind of at face value and see the beauty in it, or you can be suspicious. And you can go, well, why do you want to do that? And you can psychoanalyze it and and bring out all of the the corrupt underpinnings as to why you want to do that, right? And there is there is a time for both of those. You know, I mean, I think one without the other creates problems, right? Um, and so yeah, it's like. I like what Javier is saying, living to die versus dying to live is kind of an interesting, an interesting play on it, right? Like most people, we think about like, I want to do all these things before I die, right? You have your bucket list. And it's like all, so we do all these things so that we can die well or something, right? Um, but it is, there is another way of thinking about it where it's like you're dying to live, right? So you're, you're sacrificing your, your life for life right in sort of this this kind of paradoxical thing where you sacrifice your your current state for something in order in order to live right it's not it's not so that you can die at the end of it but it's like i'm going to sacrifice this life that i have right now so that i can live a more fulfilling life in in the present moment um i think that's that's a really good way of phrasing it and um yeah i just i keep thinking about this relationship between like will and reason and i think that like this is this is like a theological problem too of, of which comes first will or reason you know and i think that any any philosophy or theology that puts one as primary and tries to subjugate the other creates all sorts of problems um and i don't know maybe we could get into that but yeah that's that's all i gotta say right now no i i agree with what you're saying and when you separate them you get trouble and that's you know obviously that's why i find an appeal in a dialectical structure that always has kind of a bothness and this is why like i think both deleuze and Di and, and and um hegel provide resources for having a kind of bothness at play at a tension where they have to work together then the question is is you know stuff like is that a fundamental dialectical monism or dualism that's monistic and then all of those kind of more abstract metaphysical questions and different things like that uh but but i think you're right on what you're saying and that are especially like theological debates have been really really bogged down by a debate of kind of which is more primary uh say in god but then of course if you're dealing with god there's a sense of which god is outside of all of time right so that all of these are up op in operations and then that gets into debates of well you know, uh, is what God more so one than the other is there more so one in operation. Uh, and then human beings then based on that in a kind of Fourier-Bachian projection, see that in their own lives. And that can lead to imbalances and things like that. Um, but let me give it to Chitan and then Javier. And I like your hat, Chitan. That is freaking stylus. I like it. It's really cold here. So which is why I'm wearing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, see, uh, there's something actually Nietzsche is something is a very interesting figure in that sense, and you know, uh, I, I would go back to this, this distinction between well, what you call the active and the reactive forces in that sense. And if you think about that distinction, I think we we'll come back to Zach's point that um, what a distinction does is it creates a certain kind of uh, you know, so when you were this in the Socrates example, so there is this issue of you know something being acted upon. And for Nietzsche, it's a problem if that action itself becomes suspicious of itself. And that is where Nietzsche would sort of raise the question that the reactive force is a force which breaks away from its own ends. You know, it creates a fiction that it that it such that the reactive force can act back upon itself, constrain itself, make it suspicious of itself, and you know, so on and so forth. And I think I think I think I think there's there's there is some kind of a point there when when we are trying to think through that acting back on itself through reason in that sense. 
that 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 becomes possible because that force is able to reason to itself why it should not go to its own end you know in in, in some senses and whatever uh, i think i think what is interesting in, in in this is that is there a form of reason also there in a force going to its own end or is it re or reason as that says always negative in that sense it's always constraining it's always holding uh, uh, something back or is there a reason actually already always there within an active force that's the kind of i think i think framing uh, one would one would get in, in in a discussion like this because for nietzsche uh, there is a form of will involved in both the sides you know that is what he sort of calls uh, you know will to power and will to i think you know that this whole idea of will to nothingness you know that that he frames that for him the will exists on both the sides it's not a question that one has will and the other other doesn't it, it's a more complicated question for him to that degree you know then how does the reason get operationalized in this in this in this kind of a discussion in this form of thinking you know and what 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 is the relationship with reason to its environment and those are those are kind of questions that 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 emerge in you know at, at, you know that at, at what point does the subject actually encounter reason in trying to negotiate with its environment an organism actually engage, engages with reason you know in trying to and i think those are the kind of questions that we would uh, you know enter into in that sense I, I think that's excellent. And it makes me think again of um like one of the reasons Marcis Blondel in action really emphasizes action because he's like, in action, will and reason are always already there together. Uh, you know, when you act, you are both willing uh and reasoning in that. And there's somehow will for that reason and reason for that will. Now the issue kind of becomes that like the moment you act, then maybe you're acting in a bad way. Maybe your will and reason is bad, or maybe it is good. So then, you, so right there, you then kind of have, you, you need the ability to step back and go, should I be doing that action? Well, the moment you do that, the action is stopped. So there's a danger here because you've stopped the dialectical balance between the two. And now you're pulling them apart and examining them, which in one gaze is important because then you can maybe determine if the action is one you should continue to carry out or it's one that you should do. Um, but it's also dangerous in that by pulling it out of action, you've now actually created the ability to split them and then live in an abstraction where they are split. So that's this weird thing where thinking has a really important ability to correct and to check, but then in its checking, it has the ability to treat concepts in ways that they don't ever actually exist at in the world. Will and, and reason are never actually separate, but it's possible in your mind to abstractly separate them. But the only way to check and balance, if you will, action is to bring it into your mind. So the moment you bring it into your mind, there's a danger because now you can split the things and have them and, and then create like hierarchies of one is better than the other or this is always an operation and start doing that. And then all of that would then inhibit the ability to bring it back into action, right? So this is that weird tragedy, uh, really this real tension of what it means to be human. Like we have to think about things, but we can only think about things in a sense, in an abstract realm where things can be treated as they are not. So that's like the risk. Like, it's like you have to bring, it's almost like you have to bring action to make sure it's good into an active volcano. Like you can, ki you can kill everyone now, but the only place to think about if action is good or bad or action you ought to do or like want to do is to bring it, bring it into a danger zone. Uh, but then if it's in that danger zone, you could be in a danger zone. And then the harbor of it is precisely if you fall into that volcano, thinking works in a way to convince you you haven't fallen into that volcano. So not only do you bring it into an active volcano per se, or a um, uh, maybe I want to say like a labyrinth with traps or stuff, uh, something like that. Like not only do you bring it to in place, that um, I'll stick with volcano because mixing metaphors makes things confusing. Uh, the, the only thing that if you bring it in, not only is it a volcano per se that's dangerous, it's a volcano that has the ability to make you not realize you're in a volcano. It hides what it is in the activity. And so you're really in trouble. So it's dangerous to bring action into thought because you can treat it in abstract terms it never actually is in concretion. And in the act of doing that, the brain conceals you that there's danger there. 
And so it's it's such a dangerous thing to do. Uh, and yet it seems like it's necessary um, as well. So those were some thoughts. So whoever wants to speak. All right. Um, I wonder if, because I've been working on this distinction, so I'll be interested to kind of throw this in the, the war room, see what comes out. Um, it's a prayer room, <laughs> okay? Oh, wait, that is a war room according to the Hollywood. Okay, anyway. My, my distinction between uh, passion and desire, I wonder if there's a correlate between will and reason um, because passion, I have been arguing, is in some ways prior to desire because passion is something that is in a state of tension that wants to find an object. So where desire already assumes an object, desire already kind of knows its object of desire. It's already implying within itself an object to which it has direction towards. Um, so, so I think I, I share Zach's concerns with kind of like having, um, giving a kind of ordering to things, like what comes prior and first. Um, the way I've kind of worked out through this is a kind of like paradox where every ordering is a disordering, but sometimes it's, it's more about which disordering is demanded right now. Um, so I think, and this is kind of like my diagnosis, my diagnosis is that actually the disordering that's needed, the, the ordering that's disordered, um, that's needed now is actually, we need to acknowledge how passion collapses into desire. The sort of acknowledgement that passion has to collapse into desire. You cannot stay in passion. It's actually very difficult to stay in passion because again, you have to give a reason, you have to give um, an object of desire, you have to do something. So you have to, that's the risk implied with everything that we do. Um, so I, I think this passion versus desire collapsing is more about acknowledging. And I think psychoanalysis has done a great job of proving how the object that's desired is never the, you can never obtain the object. Why can you never obtain the object? Well, it's because it's always exceeding itself. And that, that's what I call passion. Passion realizes that this is, what I, when I say that I love something, I don't know what do I love, right? You know, I keep going, I keep trying to do it and it's not it, um, but I know that I love something. So I think it's this acknowledgement. I think what we need is to sort of breathe this awareness of like, okay, yes, I desire something, but ultimately, I desire desire, like I, that, that I am certain. And as, as long as I acknowledge that, I can start positioning myself in a sort of careful stance when I make decisions about things. Um, and of course, there's always the risk of making myself wrong. But in the, in the long game of it all, even making a wrong decision becomes a condition for the historical subject in the future, right? So, um, to which now we can play off of, right? Now we can look at World War II, World War I, and be like, okay, what went wrong there? Well, there was a kind of philosophy, a kind of logic that got us there, right? So we need to sort of understand that so we don't have, we, we don't make, make that happen again. Um, so I, I think, you know, my, my distinction between passion and desire is something I've been working on, which I think is very close to will and reason in this case. I think passion and will would be sort of in line with each other where desire and reason are sort of kind of entangled with each other about why am I desiring this thing? I give you reasons why. <laughs> no, all right. Thank you, Javier. And I'll give it to Mr. Fishman. And look at Javier here. Between classes, he's jumping in another academic discussion. Man, look at that guy. He's insatiable. Uh, and it makes me think like, yeah, you kind of desire desire because it sucks to be bored. Uh, like people like, it's like the reason you desire desire because just having something to desire to motivate you is really what you want more so than even the objects of desire, right? Because like, and you really do see that. Like it is interesting when you know people who have done, you know, financially well or different things like that. That, it's like it, it's very interesting they're like this sucks like what do I do now like what do I do now and I think Squid Games may have taken it a little far with that premise at the end not to give any spoilers but that's a spoiler uh and uh but there is something where like ultimately like when you when you truly are stuck in like boredom you do you truly do desire just desiring something and that being and that's and that's kind of 
Um, and then what, to me, what that shows is what we want is intrinsic motivation, like at the root of desire, like the, in the inability of desire to find an object to fulfill it, that ultimately what desire wants is ability to be a self-turning wheel. It wants the ability to be intrinsically motivated. And that's why I link those things up. But let me give it to Mr. Fishman. Um, yeah, I really like what Javier was just saying about, um, passion and desire. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of backtracking on what I was saying earlier about how, how, uh, reason constrains will but because reason like it does do that but it can also provoke will right you can also like you don't have you don't have the will to go to the gym but then the doctor tells you you've got diabetes right and suddenly you have a reason to go to the gym and that reason provokes your will right you can think about like the call to action the call to adventure is it's like oh i have a reason to do something and that that provokes the will right um and I think that's that's kind of what Javier is saying here about like passion and desire, how like a passion, if you have a passion for something, there's no way to act upon it unless you collapse that passion into a particular desire, right? Like for me, my mind always goes to rock climbing when I think about these things. It's like, I have a passion for rock climbing, but I can't go rock climbing unless I identify a particular climb that I want to do, right? Um, and and of course, once I obtain the object of my desire, I'm not going to be ultimately fulfilled. My passion remains, but it is that relationship which affords the the possibility of acting as a rock climber, right? Um, one without the other. If I if I have the desire to climb something, but I don't have the passion to actually like get up and try it, then I'm not going to be able to act as a rock climber. And if I have the the passion to go rock climbing, but I don't have a particular desire to do a particular climb, then I'm just going to be looking around searching for something to do. Right. So yeah, I think Javier's Javier's onto something here with, with this uh, passion and desire. It speaks to what Daniel likes to talk about with intrinsic motivation as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I jive with that for sure. No, I mean, that's a weird thing, right? Like there's this form of reason that's more, Maybe there's like intellectual reason that's more deconstructive and then there's reason that's more action-based that is kind of more of a positive thing, right? That has this kind of um, enabling feature. And that's what's kind of interesting. And I will note, based on a previous net conversation, you know, when I talk about intrinsic motivation, it has to go through that um, process of uh, purgatory, if you will, so that it's not just uh, untrained desire going off in all directions. We talked about children, but then adulthood and then intrinsic motivation that kind of is childlikeness, not childishness. So that's a caveat. That was a conversation we had that's important, but assuming that's what we mean. Um, but it's interesting because like what we see here is that so many concepts like reason end up getting tangled up, right? Like, like there's a double side to it, whereas there's a positive way and there's a negative side, right? When we talk about action, it's a mixture of will and reason and, and all these different things. And it's almost like, like you start off, if I go back to the action example, you start off in action and already reason and, and um, will are tangled up, right? But it's almost like the way that things naturally tangled, like start off tangled up for us is not right. Like the way they're tangled is not right. So we had like, it, they don't naturally tend to be right. Um, and so you have to think about it to say, all right, well, how do I take them apart so I can put them back together in the right way, right? But you see what tends to happen where in the brain where you can pull them apart, it's then easy to imagine them as a part and then to forget that they never, that they and then forget that they started tangled up, right? And in fact, you may even go, well, actually, the fact that these were tangled up was a problem. So maybe I should keep them apart, right? So then you keep them apart, but then you exist in an abstract realm that then has you living according to those things separated in a manner that leads to trouble, right? Because then you don't bring it back to action. Maybe you just stay in propositional knowledge or something. But then if you bring will and reason back to action, you're saying, okay, I'm going to have will be the part that is kind of, in a sense, primarily, primary, because this gets the things going. And reason is going to be in the business of checking and balancing the manifestation of that will to make sure I'm aligned with the reason of that will. And so reason then has a deconstructive element for a positive end of what that will is seeking, right? And then you could say, well, that's an order, isn't it? Yeah, but this is where it's like weird, right? Because there, it's like, is there an order to what you need to do to make a car run? Yes, the tire, you know, there's an order all the parts have to be in. 
But then the whole that emerges is not reducible to the order, right? So then like if you get the structure of how will and reason relates, both of them together end up doing things that they couldn't do otherwise. So that's why the order, there is a kind of ordering that occurs, but then the ordering is almost left behind. It's like emerges to something that's then not reducible to that order. Uh, and, that's where, and, and that's where then, because then when you're talking about an emergence, it becomes difficult to speak about because it's always both in a manner that is totally new, that is hard to describe according to the old ways you talked about them as you had to talk about them before they emerged because in fact that language was accurate. Uh, and so then that's that weird confusing move that has to occur. And then of course at any minute you can think about the, the relation again and then pull it back into abstraction and ruin the emergence, if you will, or ruin the sublation, if you will, if you want to use those terms. And now I'm using those together. Um, but those are some thoughts I had. Let me pass it to Chitan. Yeah, I think uh, this discussion between passion and desire is extremely interesting. Uh, the sort of pointer, I think, I think it's in Kant that if I, I, I don't remember my Kant too well. It's been a long time since I've engaged with it. But I think if there uh, uh, will emerge in between reason and desire. You know, will has this that, that in between position between reason and desire. I think it's, you know, where both of them sort of acts upon you know, and Kant's problem is that how do you find a form of functioning on the will where reason takes its complete, you know, uh, most actions are the struggle between reason and desire, and that's a problem for Kant in some senses. And you can get into this discussion on pure reason and so on and so forth. But I think something is interesting in Kant when Kant sort of enters into this discussion between intensity and ex extensity. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that we need to think about here is that even in Deleuze, if you if you think through that that dis distinction that comes up towards the end of different repetition, you know where he talks about that there are certain quantities which you break into two, for instance, length, breadth. You can simply get you know two lengths, two breadths, you know. But then there the quantity like temperature, which doesn't function in that manner. Temperature, density, you know, so on and so forth. So what he's sort of pointing out Deleuze is that 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 there is a form of dimension the intensive dimension, which is separate from both quality and quality and quantity. It's not a quality is intensity and quantity is extensive. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that intensity is separate from both quality and quantity. You know, it is in some senses that third dimension through which everything else sort of functions. And for, for Deleuze, when things are left to themselves, after a point, they cancel their own intensive dimension out. In some senses, and that is that, that is what is I think we we are calling reason over here in some senses. When when you allow reason to operate, you know, and that is where I think discussion on passion comes back because passion is that point in desire where the intensity is it's at its at its at its uh, you know where you you are trying to mark the intensity of the desire. Passion as a word is a point at which you want to mark the intensity of the desire. That there is something here which cannot be brought back into extensive magnitude, in back, brought back into calculations. Isn't it? That's the kind of problem we are trying to deal with. I, 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 that's what I think at least. That when we talk discussing, we discuss teaching in passion and desire. Passion as a word marks that point in desire where it cannot be brought back into calculation where it has to necessarily fall outside of its own. You know, I think something needs to be thought to uh, where, in what way does this intensive dimension, and this is a form of negativity in Hegel itself. Negativity actually in Hegel actually understands this problem. That there is a point at, at which, you know, a functioning of something, at, at some point something becomes visible to you, which gets covered up in its own development. You know, it's something of that 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 nature. I think which we need to be thinking about, and I, I think I, I think it is in that cover up that we always find reason at the heart of that that covering up taking place. You know that 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 simple idea that you know that that, that gap that gets opened up gets covered when you immediately apply reason to it. And I think what is at stake in that? I really like what you're saying about kind of the reason being a product of a kind of gap. Like, because when you see the gap, 
then the question, it's almost like, well, what's sustaining me through or despite the gap? And it's like, well, it has to be reason because there's nothing else there, <laughs> you know, in a way. And, and also it is interesting. I, I'm extremely partial toward the kind of idea that it's in failure that kind of truth comes out or in self-deception, you find out like the truth because you find out what you're seeing. Because in self-deception, you wouldn't do that if there wasn't something you were avoiding, right? Well, then there's something you're avoiding. Uh, and then there's an opportunity to figure out what that is. But funny enough, that occurs precisely in the mechanism of avoiding that thing. So right when you are like, right when there's kind of an indirect acknowledgement that there's a truth is precisely the beginning of the mechanism to avoid that truth, right? And so how do you, is there a glimpse there? Is there a second there where you may catch it? Uh, and as you know, I'm very partial with Javier and Thomas Jockin, like the, the glimmers and the glimpses of the philosophy of glimmers and different things like that. Um, and yeah, it is like also it's when desire fails, you find out if it's actually passion because it's almost like a, um, it's almost like a Schrodinger's cat thing before you open the box. It's both alive and death at the same time. Like when you're living for something, it's kind of a mixture of desire and passion to you. But then when there's a failure, you find out, oh, actually, it always was a desire because it's gone now. Or you go, oh, wait, no, it actually always was a passion because in the failure, I still have it. I still have this thing that's sustaining me through it. And now it's like that moment reaches back in time and makes it so that you always had a passion, not a mixture of desire and passion. And now you have a passion going forward. I call that like a flip moment where something happens in the present that changes the meaning of what always occurred. But you can't, it's like you can't know what was always occurring until that test, right? You can, it's like once you open the, the box in Schrodinger's cat, it's not that the cat becomes alive or becomes dead. It turns out that it always was one or the other. It's just before the box opened, you couldn't know, right? Now, of course, there are people that question that experiment, but if you grant me it as a metaphor here. Uh, and it's funny how it is in the um, failure that then it's like the, it's like the, the it's like the flip moment. It's, it's the test that you find out. And so therefore you need the failure, right? In order to like kind of figure out what it is. But then of course you can come up with hypothetical situations where you never have the failure. So then you have to kind of trust what you think it is. And is there alternative mechanisms of determining if it's say it's a passion or a desire without a failure that aren't just susceptible to self-deception? Maybe, you know, we may like to think there is because then we don't have to fail. Yay. So therefore we should probably be very skeptical of any uh, heuristic we arrive at where we can determine the difference without failure. But that doesn't mean it is necessarily impossible. Uh, so that, that's a question I, I wonder about. And then I guess that's like, you know, in theology, it's often beauty or disaster. That's an unveiling of the divine, right? So that, that keep coming back to that different thing. But Mr. Javier Rivera. Actually, uh, I really like Jatan's distinction here between the, the, third, the third category, right? The quantity, intensity, and, and quality. Um, because now it makes me think when we talk about negativity and sublation, it makes me think when we talk about the subject, is there a kind of mechanism that's going on today where what is happening is that so, somehow society has found a way to sort of prevent the intensity from reaching a breaking point so that the subject could then realize its own negativity so then that way it could sublate into the other discourse. You know, so I guess like this question that Tatan like raises that I'm thinking through, it's like, that means that the subject really requires a kind of intensity to then realize the negativity to then, then go into sublation, right? And I think I would, I mean, I, I don't know, is it fair to say that that mark of intensity is sort of different for everybody? But, you know, is there... Um, yeah, is there a sort of mechanisms of control that sort of like prevent that intensity from breaking that we never get to basically? Like, it's not that we, we can't think negative, negativity or whatever, it's that we can't existentially experience negativity because there seems to be mechanisms that sort of prevent us from reaching that breaking point where finally I, I, I realize something, I, I, I reach an epiphany basically um, about what's happening. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, that's kind of the question I'm raising. Mm. Well, I'll pass it to whoever wants to. It makes me think of existentialism as a test. 
Like is existentialism the test where you find out if it was always desire or passion, you know, or if it was, um, you know, a representation or an idol or, you know, different things like that. And if you never have existentialism in your life, that would be an indication of a lack of a moment of opening the box of Schrodinger's cat. And therefore you can never find out what it is. So funny enough, in a way, like avoiding existentialism seems like a good thing because existentialism sucks. Uh, but without it, you never have a test to determine, you know, if it was passion or if it's desire. And that's where then Kierkegaard makes that lovely line where he says the man who's really in despair is the one who doesn't know he's in despair. If you know you're in despair, yeah, that's a great step because then you can like move out of it. What sucks is if you're happy, because then, because that means you don't know that you shouldn't be happy or something. <laughs> Good old Kierkegaard with his coffee that was pure sugar. Uh, but uh, but there is something funny about that. Where actually there is like I like what Kierkegaard's getting at because there's a sense of what what he's saying is that if you never face despair, that means the self deception. That means the self deception won, right? Because he also just basically has an assumption that every single human being on planet Earth is self-deceived, right? Like every single human being is captured by a representation or an image that's not the actuality. And therefore, the only possibility that you never face existential tension would mean that that idol, as he'll call it, never fails, right? Uh, so therefore, if you never face anxiety, you must be in despair. Like that's his logic. You see what I'm saying? You assume that every human being is engaged in self-deception. I think that's a pretty fair assumption. I mean, there may be, I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, of all the assumptions, that one's, that one's not too bad. Uh, except for, you know, maybe someone who's learned to live in harmony with the animals in the forest. That person, all right, Kierkegaard's not talking about it, but the rest of us down here, <laughs> you know, he's got us. Uh, he's got us back. Um, and so it's interesting to think of a lack of existentialism. But then it would almost be like, so if existentialism in this sense is the intensity, right? Like, um, is there a kind of intensity that's too much or an intensity that loses our ability to discern an intensity that would actually be um, kind of problematic or is the intensity actually the necessary third that can bring those things together? Uh, but, uh, but let me pass it to who wants to speak. Yeah, I just sort of quickly want to uh, sort of add to what you've know, been saying that so if you think about intensity is a very interesting, in, interesting idea. It's interesting because if, you know, if you look at Hegel, um, in Hegel, also negativity functions the same, but it does intensity gives you a very, very nice uh, way to think through separate from quality and quantity in that sense. So Hegel, the problem of Delius is that that minute you have multiplicity, you know, if you have pure multiplicity, if you if you notice, there is already some kind of unity taking taking the shape within the multiplicity. The multiplicity itself is getting covered up within itself. There is, a, there is a form of certainty for a certain kind of unity, which is which is hounding multiplicity from inside. It's not a unity which is coming from the outside. It's not a unity which is imposed upon the multiplicity from the outside. And as you were saying, will and reason in that sense. But there is a form of unity which is being imposed upon the multiplicity from the inside itself. The minute something opens up in, in its own plurality to you, you immediately bring within it within it a certain coherence, certain unity, certain totality, which starts ex which excludes certain form of you know, and it is it is it is in that opening, it is in in that minute when that multiplicity gets opened to you, that intensive dimension becomes visible to you. But that is what intensity is essentially. It is it is this this radical presence of the multiplicity, multiplicity to you. Which is why Javier said that, you know, object is not there in passion. Because object is a unity in itself, in, in that sense. You know, object itself assumes a unity. And I think we still need a good theory of object in philosophy, which you don't have, uh, you know, um, till now. But uh, um, even even given that, what what is at stake, I think, is that there is a certain unity, certain certainty, and which is where Hegel starts the discussion from also. Hegel's problem exactly is what is, that, what is at stake in that certainty. You know, he's always, and that is where I think failure becomes extremely important because you already are functioning to certain certainty which needs to fail for you to actually be able to move, <laughs> you know, uh, in, in any kind of uh, direction. And then I think there's something to be thought to, uh, you know, in that. You know, I associate kind of existentialism because existentialism kind of occurs precisely when there's like an opening of possibility, like the radical freedom Sartre talks about or Kierkegaard's like, you know, you can take the leap of faith any way you want. And it's like, yeah, it might be crazy, but you can be crazy. That is an option. Oh, 
Frick. Well, that changes things because, you know, Kierkegaard's like, you know, because basically people escape the multiplicity with, with reason. They say, well, there is a, re there is an objective rationality. It's rational to do this. Therefore, that's the only thing you really can do. If you're not doing that, you're not really doing anything. Uh, and so rationality becomes like a sing like a singular track that helps you avoid the multiplicity from the inside. And Kierkegaard's like, no, 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 you can be crazy. And it's like, oh, I can be. So why aren't I crazy? He's like, yeah, especially when you realize that rationality is arbitrarily grounded. Dang it. Uh, and so then you have to face the multiplicity. And it and facing that multiplication brings that anxiety and therefore the anxiety. But then what's, what's interesting is it's like if we have a kind of redemptive, like the anxiety also brings a kind of redemption to it, right? Because you can, you're free, you can create, you're not bound by the multiplicity. You can do these different things, right? You can actually have a meaningful distinction between passion and, and desire or find out what these things are as opposed to just be kind of swept along with the tangled concepts in no way. So there's a, there, it's not a despair that doesn't bring with it any hope. It's a, it's a hope that only is possible from a place of despair because the despair is kind of a result of the death of the pre-existing. But really to have hope, don't you have to kill the pre-existing? Like if the, you know, the pre-existing is there and you're stuck in the pre-existing, there's really no hope in a sense other than maybe a, um, a, uh, a hope for a new show on it, Netflix that is, that is good, but kind of in a weak sense hope, not a kind of strong sense event hope, right? There has to be a death of the pre-existing, but that would mean meaningful hope precisely requires the anxiety that then makes it seem like to go through means there is no hope. That's kind of the funny thing. Like if you're facing that anxiety, that feels like there is no hope because, oh my gosh, there's a multiplicity and I'll never figure out what it's due. But precisely in that existential condition is when a deep, meaningful hope becomes possible, which then makes me think about what Javier was saying at the beginning about how dying to live and live to die. And they all kind of go together in a fun way. The moment you have a reason, you also have not a reason. But this is almost like a different sense because it is the hope that comes out of the actual encounter of the horizon of the truth of the multiplicity. Uh, that was a mouthful, but I had to get Get that in there let me give it to javier so I, I really like your work on intrinsic motivation daniel because it really does you know bring this question of if it, okay we understand that if failure sort of helps us realize the truth right and i think obviously this is where you're going towards like what is going to provoke us like the way zach would have you use the phrasing i like you know reason can kind of provoke the will, right? So it almost seems like there's a sort of dead will going on, but we need a sort of a provoking for failure, right? And it's funny because like I'm in school, right? The, the conception of failure is like, it's, it should be avoided at all costs. <laughs> you know, if people are trying to get into med school, like, you know, like failure is not an option anymore. <laughs> so it does concern me that we live in a society where, failure doesn't even mean a second chance you know it failure means your life is done um your life is over um and this is the mentality that's sort of going on right now where failing is is that's it it's it's living to die like i would say um so this idea that how do we reframe life how do we provoke failure not not provoke success not provoke um all these other stuff you know I, I think um because i think failure really is the the revealing of that intensity i think of like what Chitong would be saying um, when when desire is gone and passion remains <laughs> when you can no longer attain the object because you don't know what the object is um there's a sense of failure in that and it, it, ironically a sense of anxiety in that which we can't remain in all the time but there seems to be some type of mechanism in place that I think we can provoke to just sort of like embrace this condition, um, you know, and feed this condition more often. I, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, a lot of my work on timing is like epiphany is a good thing, right? But what I'm trying to do is, is there a, a framing? Is there a way of being that we can have more epiphanies, more, more reflections, more you know, understandings about like, oh, like, oh, wow, like, I didn't know I was like this, you know, kind of stuff like that. Um, so I, I still think there is a way of, a way of being that we can do this, you know, where instead of accidentally stumbling upon it, we can 
frame it to where timing happens and I and I encounter a real epiphany, a real concrete understanding about myself. Um, but it has to do with like a sort of framing, a way of being, you know, provoking, taunting failure. Maybe that is one one way. I'll give it to Mr. Mr. Um, Hyrude. And um, I, um, yeah, I have a lot to say on how we have a social order that doesn't let you fail, only allows you to be a failure. Uh, you know, it's a society not of development, but finding out who's qualified, which is basically a society of being versus becoming. And we've talked a million times how being is kind of pathological and it has a neurotic character to it. Don't get me wrong. You have to have some kind of qualification system. I'm not saying that, but a, like a qualification system that has no, me no real mechanism of failure or no real mechanism of development other than just kind of sorting out who was born with the best genes or not. Yeah, no wonder you have a meaning crisis. Uh, of course you do. Like I... You know, because because you because it is very well documented that one of the number one places that you get mental health illness is in the Ivory League schools where kids get the first B of their entire life and have no way to process it. So they totally mentally break down. Uh, you're like, why are you mentally breaking down? Because they never failed because they've never been allowed to fail. If they had failed, they wouldn't be at the Ivory League. So like this society, so that is actually like in regard to the meat, like there's a lot of talk about a lack of religion, a lack of practices and different things like that for the meaning crisis. And I know we've all talked about different problems with the language of the meaning crisis, even if there's a sense in which it's a sociological reality regarding the mental health crisis and different things. Obviously I use the phrase, I'm not saying the phrase should not be used, but one of the dangers is that a big part of what causes the meaning crisis is the lack of sociological structures that allow failure without being a failure or having opportunities ra radically cut off from you. Until that is changed, you are absolutely creating a society that's going to be filled to the brim with pathologies, neurosis, hopelessness, and despair. Because of course you're hopeless. You got to be in high school. So literally all the possibilities of your future are radically changed. Maybe you got to be because you took the most challenging class while everyone else took the class they knew was an easy teacher. And so they got A's and they got to go to the Ivory Leagues while you didn't because you took the class that was really challenging. So you get punished for a challenge while the other people get an A. Yeah, that's a recipe for a messed up society. Anyway, let me give it to Mr. Fishman. I'm sorry. That topic, I, 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 think, it's, I think it's insane. Well, I just, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on, on what Javier and, and Daniel and what everyone's been saying about this uh, the way that failure reveals uh, if there's passion underneath the desire. Um, it's kind of interesting that like success also does that, right? So like success and failure kind of come together in this way, right? Like if you have a desire to become a doctor and you fail to get into med school, that will reveal if there was really any passion underneath it, but so will becoming a doctor, right? Once you have that desire, once you've obtained it, then you really get to see whether there was passion there all along, right? Because if you fail, you can still kind of like hold on to the desire, right? Um, it's really only in success that you have to face the, the existential terror of like, you know, why am I like, am I really motivated to do this? Um, and so, yeah, it's just interesting the way that success and failure kind of come together in the way that they reveal um, the existential terror of life. <laughs> um, but on that note, yeah, it's, it's been great. Thank you, guys. You're awesome, Hybrid. That's an excellent point. And it, it makes me think of like Ebert's saturation stuff. Like, you know, at saturation, it's complete ex pure excess. It's nothingness. So it is amazing how success and failure both have the same existential function of unveiling what's in the box, the Schrodinger's cat box, uh, if the cat is alive or it's a dead, because it seems like it's that pure excess. Where then it's like at that pure excess, there's, there's no way to distract yourself anymore or something. There's no way. It's like you lose plausible deniability. Like before you get there, you can plausibly deny that your desire isn't just the desire. You can plausibly deny that it's also a passion, but at that point, then you're forced to, to find out, or at the point of absolute failure, you're forced to, to find out. I think that was an excellent point, Hybrid. Let me give it to Michelle. Michelle, good to see you, hon. Well, great to see you all as well, of course, and um, thank you all for being here. I was thinking about how like the doctor example is very good. Um, like if it's interesting because it's it's interesting because failing to become a doctor you know, you can always kind of idealize what it would be like to be a doctor, you know, like one day I'll be a doctor and I'll be so successful, I'll be healing all these people, I'll be saving all these people. The reality is if when you become a doctor, 
somebody's going to die on your shift. Like you, you, you know, you're not going to be able to save every person. And it's very hard. It's very difficult to encounter the, con the, the concretization of failure in actually becoming like successfully becoming a doctor. So I think what I want to say is that like, it seems as though reality will always be a bothness of failure and success, right? Um, if we don't become a doctor, the, the interesting thing about that is that it's, it's kind of like, in a way you failed, but you kind of succeeded at not letting anyone die, right? So, so you kind of have your own sort of interesting <laughs> success there too. So it's just kind of the way we think about it. And I think if we it, like broaden our horizon on that and our understanding on the complexity of, of success and failure, I think it would like it would I think it would help us a bit more with with not being so certain about what is failure and, and success so that we get paralyzed because when we get so certain we can get paralyzed um, and not really continue to move forward uh, with living and understanding that there's this nuance to failure uh, and success so I, I just wanted to say that but yeah all of the thoughts are really great <laughs> you know, it's like, wait, wait. no I, I think that is uh, extremely important and like unfortunately it's tragic but it's well documented on the levels of unhappiness alcoholism suicide mental illness in the medical profession precisely because if you're there you've like especially if you're a high-end adult you've succeeded all your life and then your first failure is arguably the worst of all possible failures someone dies like to go from that level of extremity is very very difficult now that's that's not always the case and in different things but it is Definitely a society, um, and then I'll pass to whoever wants to speak as we come with it, definitely a society that does not have mechanisms to regularly and really encounter failure only to be a failure is going to be a society that is going to have, um, well, the meaning crisis. I mean, that's just, an, that is a integral dimension of what's causing what is called the meaning crisis. Um, and, and that's why I think it, it, and I think that needs to be discussed um, in addition to, you know, the loss of religion, the loss of pride, all these things that like Verveke is emphasizing, but the social lack of those mechanisms in a meaningful sense, not just you can go like lose a board game at home. Okay, yes, I can go lose a board game at home, but that's not part of the social system where failure, um, where failure can do, can do things. Um, and Haven can read everyone your poem. That's perfectly fine. And then we'll get, you go right ahead, Haven. It uh, so, okay, so this is it. All life long, one flamingo song will fill the void until it's gone. If we fall, mingle and brawl with the wherewithal, we will see that the goal was never to go to the mall. To man up and fan the flames of withdrawal, it was to get gone with the wind gel of the with the call of the gnomes knowing, nail it only to no avail. <laughs> Snap, Haven. Snap. Nice, Haven. Nice. Excellent. So that's our spoken word. Very nice, Haven. Good yeah, job, Haven. I did not write that poem. But you read it really well. You read it well, Haven. That was great. Thank yeah, you for he, sharing. <laughs> yeah, he gave the assignments. Like, he had this, uh, he has this, like, workbook. And there's this, like, find 20 words in this, you know, find 20 words in all these letters, right? And so he found the 20 words. And then he's like, mommy, can you make a poem for me with those 20 words? And so that was my attempt. <laughs> <laughs> well done. It was relevant to the discussion as well. That was, that was outstanding. <laughs> flamingos in the void. <laughs> well, flamingos in the void are always relevant to the discussion. So that's Deleuze and Hegel or something. So that's perfect. Uh, but, uh, but let me give it to everyone to speak as we come on the close. Yeah, I'll say one more thing. Um, recently, I asked my friends, you know, if it weren't for the fact that you're trying to get into doctor, you know, like med school, um, you know, one of the things about them being afraid to fail is that they're not able to properly engage with the subject because they worry about failing. Um, but I asked my friend, you know, if you, if failure was allowed to happen, would you be able to actually like really enjoy physics, and anatomy? Um, and they said, yeah, absolutely. Like just the pressures of not, you know, ruining my success of, becoming a doctor, I would actually be able to engage with the subject in a more pure and, and, and real way and sort of being allowed to fail, right? Not having this worry of like, my life is done because I can't become a doctor anymore because the criteria doesn't let me or allow me to have failed, basically. Um, so there seems to be an effect not only on mental health, but an effect in a sort of an epistemology where we 
are giving success or preventing failure, but this prevention of failure is also affecting our sort of engagement with real topics and engagement with real understanding about things. Um, just because I'm just trying to make sure I pass and not fail. Um, so it, there does seems to be an, an epistemological consequence to this. Like, you know, the, the doctor that's afraid to fail, he doesn't engage fully with physics because he made sure he didn't fail physics, you know? <laughs> you know? So he's he's sort of insincere about that subject because he's afraid to, it doesn't allow sincerity to occur. I think that's my main concern. It's like there isn't real sincerity engagement. In the I completely agree. Um, it's very hard to love something you can't fail at. Uh, and one of the reasons why I actually think desire can be loved and thus we can be a self-turning wheel is because desire can fail. That's where in that piece I was saying that the inability of desire to fulfill itself is precisely the condition that makes possible intrinsic motivation. Um, one of the reasons why religions uh, were important, and Vivek is right about this, is religions created opportunities to fail at something without being a failure in your everyday practice. You may fail to meet the moral law, but you can get better. Like you can do it. Yes, you failed. You, you did indeed fail, but you can, you're not therefore a failure. Now, of course, there is a ultimate failure possibility, right? But it's not like you overslept for a test one Friday, therefore your future is completely ruined, right? Like that's not the game. And when you have a social order that has those kind of possibilities, there's a lot of neurotic people. Uh, and then it's also like, well, then of course it creates status anxiety or it creates like pride and hierarchy because Frick, I passed the test. You didn't. You're a failure. I'm not. And then we wonder why we have a society of like class tensions and different things like that, because you basically have greatly contributed to that with the very social structure. Um, no, I, I think it is um, I, I, I the, the lack of the ability in the stro social structure to have failure actually then makes it very difficult to in the social structure have you could say passion, uh, be, you know, the social structure can create desire, but it can't really create passion. And I'm saying the social structure. I'm not saying these aren't possible in the society on an individual level. I'm talking about the social structure that helps determine who's a doctor, who's a nurse, who's an engineer, who's not. That's what I'm talking about here. It is very difficult to create passion in those environments. And But don't worry, guys. Once you get the job, then we'll have mindfulness room and then we'll talk about meaning and then you can have the passion. No. You just went through 10 years of losing the ability to do that. And all your values and structures of thought were habituated to not do that. You can't just add that later on. Uh, you can't just say, oh, crap, we need to bring passion back. So have meaning at your job, which then just sounds like a capitalist ploy so that you're a good employee, right? You're just using meaning at that point to freaking turn people into an employee. It doesn't work. It has to be all the way down. It has to be integrated into the structure. It can't be sprinkles. You can't be sprinkles. And then, yeah, and then the, like for the 10 people who get the sprinkles, there's 100,000 that now define themselves as a failure. Well, then we don't care what they say because they're a failure. Oh, okay, that's a great social order you got there, right? Because that's what you do. You then say the people that are a failure, their opinion doesn't matter because they're a failure. Oh, okay. And then we wonder why the political order is a disaster and people are turning to strong man and everything is kind of going to crap, right? I mean, it, it's it's... It's amazing. It's truly amazing. Uh, but anyway, um, so yes. Yeah, so in my opinion, a lot of the top of self-forgetfulness, non-rational society has a whole lot to do with tearing down the monopoly, the college monopoly on credentials is what I call it. And to replace it with modeling through things like employment testing, thanks to opportunity. If there is a 40 year old single mother down the street who has done the work to be a better coder than the 18 year old at Harvard, why can't she have the job just because he didn't go to Harvard, right? It's crazy. It's crazy to say that a single mom, in order to get qualified for a coding job, has to go back through college to get the qualification. If she's got the skill, which now you can do thanks to the internet and different abilities that we didn't have in the past, which brings to mind Ivan Illig's unschooling, de-schooling education. There are possibilities now that were not possible in the past. Yes, maybe in the past, this sort of modeling of qualification that we're saying is problematic was necessary given the historical moments but now that tragedy is not as necessary 
in my opinion. And so therefore, you can be bringing failure into the system. And the very existence of the meaning crisis can be evidence that you must make that change because in failing to make that change, the historic moment is now unveiling certain social pathologies that are being unveiled. So yes, I'm glad the topic came up. I think it's a freaking big deal. Um, and, it, and it really, really is greatly contributing to a lot of the pathologies and the neurosis of the society. Um, anyway, it's always a pleasure to speak to you fine people. Thank you for being here. Hi, Ruth, you're great. You. Javier, you're great. Good G-Town, morning. you're great. Um, ha Haven, good reading of the poem. Michelle, you're great. Everyone is great. Thank you for being here. Glad we could talk about things. Always great. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.